Hi, I'm Frank Gottschall Boyce, and this is my Blue Peter badge. I'm going to start by reading you an extract from a novel that I love. It's called Human Voices. It's by Penelope Fitzgerald. And she worked at the BBC during World War II. This is what she wrote. Broadcasting House was dedicated to the strangest project of the war, or of any war. That is the project of telling the truth. Without prompting, the BBC had decided that truth was more important than consolation, and in the long run, would be more effective. Yet there was no guarantee of this. Truth ensures trust, but not victory, or even happiness. I've got that pinned up on my wall. I really hope that by the end of today, you will have figured out a way to defend the BBC, because the BBC can't really defend itself. The unique and tragic paradox at its heart is that constitutionally it has to be above politics, but its existence is a political decision, how it's funded and all that. So strictly speaking, the BBC can't even take a view about whether it should exist or not. If we had learned one thing from the pandemic, it's surely that we interpret the world through stories. When it all began, like feels like a million years ago, we, and I include cabinet ministers and policymakers in that we, we read it, through the lens of a certain kind of story. The kind of story in which the thin veneer of civilization is cracks under the pressure of fear and shortage. Stories like Lord of the Flies, if you're my age, or Fortnite, if you're my kid's age. Stories that said that any moment now we might raid the supermarkets and club each other to death with toilet rolls. And when that didn't happen, when on the contrary, we started shopping for our elderly neighbors, and putting rainbows in our windows and having socially distanced street parties and inventing new ways to celebrate or to mourn. We found ourselves in a different kind of story, a kind of reboot of the Blitz spirit with an unimpeachably World War II hero in Captain Tom. We become the stories that we tell. So who gets to tell the story is everything. Because another thing we've learned, or we should have learned, is that stories are bore a vacuum. When one storyteller moves away from the campfire, another storyteller will take their place. And their story might not be the happy tale of Captain Tom. It might be a story about how medical science is really a big conspiracy bent on delivering sheeple into the hands of paedophile owl worshippers. It might be a story about how your democracy has been stolen by a global elite. It might be a story that stokes fury, a story delivered by a not so subtle knife, slicing everything into vicious binary choices, leave or remain, mask or no mask, vac or no vac, Megan or Kate. Stories that are designed to create division by people who profit from division. Pandemic's been a, obviously, obviously been a defining moment for streaming services. The BBC used to have an, a more or less uncontested reputation for quality drama. But if Netflix and Amazon can do it, why should the BBC? If Sky can do sport, why should the BBC? Because a BBC stripped back to its basic public service remit, which is one of the things that's on the table. That's not the BBC anymore. That's like a country stripped down to its geology. It's not a country anymore. It's just a rock formation sticking out of the sea. What the BBC does and what these services don't do and can't afford to do is listen to us, speak to us in our voice. And I'm talking here as someone who is very proud to have written a successful film for Netflix and who is frankly chuffed to blast buttons to be working on one for DreamWorks. The DreamWorks film is set in the lovely Galloway town of Kukubri. So I really do know what I'm talking about when I say they don't speak in our accent. Kirk could bright. Everywhere I go in the world, I see local broadcasters who should be nurturing, cherishing, expressing, expanding local culture, being squeezed to the margin by giant commercial broadcasters, giant global commercial broadcasters. 
There'll be a lot of complicated and passionate discussion today about why that's bad and how we might be able to arrest it. But I want to say something really simple. I just want to say thank you. The BBC helped make me. I don't mean as a screenwriter, I mean as a human being, as a happy human being. The children's television that I grew up with was wildly innovative and inspiring. And here is the thing that I want to express and emphasize. It was at its most wildly innovative and inspiring, precisely when it was being most public service. I'm talking about Vision On. Vision On was a program designed to give deaf children a chance to enjoy television, but not one moment of that show was in any way pious or worthy or eat your veg. It was exploding with absolutely unhinged creativity. And I'm not using the word inspiring here as a word of praise. I'm using it as a statement of fact. I always hesitate to say things that smack of nostalgia, but what is nostalgia, but a way of holding the present accountable to the past. These moments that I remember, these are the seeds of time, some of which grew into great trees of soft power and economic importance. Vision On gave a space, it was called The Gallery, and it was introduced like this, and now The Gallery. For children like me to exhibit their own work. It also provided a platform for a nascent Armin animation. They did this little creature called Morph, I don't know if you remember Morph, to begin their journey to Wallace and Gromit. Dave Sprockton, I've got a quote from Dave Sprockton, one of the founders of Artman, he said, we were lucky enough to have a little contract with the BBC Children's TV. We never imagined that it would develop into a major studio of international reputation. The Paddington films, which I insist are the greatest creation of our culture. They've got their, obviously they've got their roots in Michael Bond's books, but the bear took his first very little steps towards global domination in a scrappy little stop motion series that was tucked into a slot before the news. And this is before we start talking about my Blue Peter Batch and Blue Peter. The soft power and financial clout that these things produced are really important and they, they're part of the ecology of public service broadcasting that they lead to these commercial things, but they're also the least important thing. The most important thing is that they were addressed to us and that through them, it felt as though the nation was turning towards us as children saying, this is yours, come on in, put something in the gallery. There was a space for us in there. And shared memories were created. We're living in a moment of really, really sharp, angry division, accelerated inequality, a kind of national identity crisis, like a kind of nervous breakdown of disagreement about what reality is. When we can't agree on fundamental things like this, it is more important than ever that we agree on what's funny, what's exciting, what's ridiculous, what's sad, who we are. And only the BBC can hold that mirror up to us. Only the BBC, a national broadcaster, can create these shared memories that are, in the jargon, site-specific. The site in question being this scepter dial. Nothing stands still, said George Orwell in The Lion and the Unicorn. We must add to our heritage or lose it. We must grow greater or grow less. We must go forward or go backward. I hope today that you find a way for us to go forward. Thank you.